Hello and welcome to Sense and Sensibility, the Inflation Guy podcast. I am Michael Ashton. I am the Inflation Guy. I am your host. And today on the podcast, we're going to talk about the monthly CPI report, where I think the most interesting thing about it uh, is is market reaction. Uh, but I'll get to that in just a moment. First of all, I want to recognize our sponsor. This episode of Sense and Sensibility is sponsored by Simplify ETFs, a fast-growing manager of liquid alternative ETFs. Simplify is bringing Wall Street to Main Street by providing access to institutional strategies perfect for diversifying your equity and bond portfolios, previously only available to big institutions and the ultra-rich. Check out their website at simplify.us. That's simplify.us. And you can find their entire lineup of ETFs at simplify.us slash ETFs. So we'll get in a bit to sort of the the market reaction uh, today. But um, I think it's sort of useful here to sort of re- harken back to episode 106 of this podcast, which was called A Potential Pony Situation. And... And that was back in April. Um, and the the data that month, um, so it was March's figure, showed core CPI was like really high. And But the good news was that if you looked at the median CPI, um, it provided a much calmer uh, reading and basically said, look, there's a lot of outliers here. We shouldn't worry too much about this the, the big core jump. And so that was the potential pony uh, under the pile of uh, of uh, horse bucky, and uh, and so that and it turns out that we're we're kind of getting a little bit of the opposite effect this month. But let let me um, let me go through sort of the 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 data as as I saw it. We were expecting coming into the day a zero point two percent rounded on headline and on core. And um, but but a little bit weaker than that. So um, the the consensus from economists was about zero point one nine percent on on core, and uh, and actually the inflation swap market was more like zero point one six. So so a little softer. Everyone was was thinking that that core inflation would round up to zero point two. Um, and in fact, that's what happened. It rounded up to zero point two, but it was actually slightly softer than people were expecting. But look, we're talking about you know hundredths here, not tenths. the The headline inflation you know, year on year is now down to two point nine percent. That was slightly lower than the year on year expected. Again, all rounding error. It rounded down instead of up. And um, and core inflation was ex- was as expected three point two year on year. Um, but again, we're talking about hundredths of a miss, not much of a miss. And so this is actually one of those months where um, you, you really do have to sort of dig into the figures to, to figure out, you know, whether a lot of times you'll get a miss and then it's only by digging in that you figure out why the miss wasn't a big deal or was a big deal. Uh, in this case, we we hit it on the mark. And so you have to look a bit, a little bit deeper to figure out whether or not hitting it on the mark is is fair. I mean, after all, there are two ways – for a flag that's tied to the middle of a rope to to sort of stay in an unchanged position. One is that nobody's pulling on either end of the rope and it's just sitting there. And the other is that massive forces are pulling on both sides of the rope and they're just offsetting. And so the, the, the flag just stands there you know, as in a tug of war. And so you don't really know when you get that point two whether, hey, look, everything was point two. It was just a really you know, boring kind of number or whether, Hey, there's a lot of exciting stuff. It just all happened to offset. Um, before I go any further into that, I, I, I do want to say that, you know, this was one of those months that happens periodically where PPI, the producer price index preceded the CPI by a day. So PPI was yesterday. It was lower than expected. It made people very happy. And whenever that happens, you get a lot of commentary about how, oh, this might be foreshadowing for CPI. CPI is going to be weak. And, and uh, oh, this is, you know, good news for, for uh, you know, producers because, you know, lower cost of inputs and so on and so forth. Um, PPI doesn't matter. I mean, it's a, it is, you could take, there are pieces of PPI that inform on some of the other consumer 
uh, price indices like you know PCE and and, uh, and even CPI, um, and so it can help you improve your forecast a little bit. But PPI jumps all around and. It doesn't really tell us a whole lot about it. Consumer inflation and consumer inflation is what the Fed looks at. It's what you and I pay. It's it's the important number. And so producer, you know, they they always put out the PPI, but it just you you really should just ignore it when it when it comes out. People always ignore it when it comes out after CPI, but uh, when it comes out before, you should you should still ignore it. Um, so anyway, as I said, the the overall figure here was was 0.155% on core inflation. So just barely rounding up to 0.2. Um, but what's really fascinating to me, so that comes out and like anybody who's in the markets, I've got a chart of, you know, uh, equity market futures up on my screen. And, and so, you know, it, it's always fun because, you know, 10 seconds before the number, the market jumps or the market sells off. And everyone thinks that somebody else has the number. Oh, my God, someone already knows what it is. And it's just somebody put in a market order and there's there's no market. So it just jumps around. But um, but that's always sort of fun. So you, you got that little jump up, jump down and then and then nothing, uh, you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes later, futures were still essentially unchanged. And that's it's been it's really odd. It's been a long time since we've had a CPI report where that happened. And that could be just because no one cares about inflation anymore. They all care about the jobs number. And truly, the jobs number is more important now than it was and probably more important than inflation. Um, but inflation still matters an awful lot. <laughs> it really does matter to the Fed's trajectory. So you still should say should pay attention to, to inflation. And I think people were. But I think coming in, folks knew – and Grant, by the way, it's August. So, <laughs> you know, there's – Trading desks are are lightly staffed, uh, to put it mildly. And but I think people coming in sort of knew, okay, if it's strong, here's what I'll do. Here's what the market should do. If it's weak, here's what the here's what that means. Here's what the market should do. And and so when we got an as expected print, everybody kind of started looking around at everyone else. Or everyone actually looked at market action and said, okay, if it goes up, then I'm just going to pile in. If it goes down, I'm going to pile in. And it didn't go anywhere. It's been a long time since we've seen that kind of reaction to to a CPI report. So that that I think was was sort of interesting, uh, in an, and maybe the most interesting thing uh, to come out of today's data. Um, now let's look. Let's let's do that that deeper dive now. One of the things which is, you know, every month I say, you know, core goods uh, just can't go any lower. Right. I mean, you know, you've got deep deflation in core goods. And a lot of that is sort of paying back for the initial, you know, supply chain spike. But we're past base effects. We just have we just have this downward pressure on core goods, which is is starting to get to the unexplainable level, you know, why it is that, you know, goods prices just keep falling month on month. Um to be fair, a lot of that is used cars. Um, used, you know, um, but, but apparel was down almost a half a percent this month, month on month. Um, and it's only up 1.1% year on year. And apparel is a good canary in the coal mine for core goods. Um, cause almost all, or at least the part that's affected by the dollar, because almost all apparel that's consumed in the United States is produced elsewhere. And so when the dollar is really strong, apparel prices don't go up very much. And when the dollar is really weak, they tend to go up more. Um, and we've sort of had the dollar go flattish for a while here, and um, and yet apparel prices are still under pressure. So that's sort of interesting. But apparel is only two percent of the CPI, um, and used cars is important, continues to be important. And this month it fell two point three percent, a little bit more than people were expecting. Um, but we were expecting a, a decline because the Black Book survey is still declining and, and, and what have you. Um, but, um, that's, that's obviously an important part of, of core goods. It's a bigger weight. Um, but I'd also pay attention to, to that, uh, apparel thing. Now keep in mind, by the way, okay, so we have minus one, one, the minus 1.9% year on year, um, on core goods, which again, is just, <laughs> I mean, that's the lowest in 20 years and it keeps getting lower. Once we get back to sort of some sort of equilibrium in core goods, it should be around zero. 
It had been in deflation for a long, long time. Um, it should be around zero these days or maybe even a little bit positive because especially once we get past the presidential election, both presidential candidates have have sort of made clear that that uh, they want to protect the American worker. And that means tariffs and that means, you know, more protectionism. Protectionism under the Biden administration has actually been there have actually been uh, far more negative trade you know, trade restrictions uh, than any other administration in you know, decades. So, um, which is kind of odd because we sort of think of Trump as being the big tr- protectionist, but he was compared to the prior administrations, uh, you know, Obama and Bush. But he was a piker compared to the Biden administration, which has been has seen much more uh, trade uh, restriction than than trade liberalization. Um, I'm actually going to have a chart of that in my quarterly inflation outlook. Um, but anyway, so that's that's core goods. I continue to be flummoxed. It's eventually going to head back up towards zero. And so, um, but right now, that's the main thing that's sort of pushing down on core inflation. Core goods, though, core goods went, or core services rather, went down to 4.9% year on year versus 5.1%. So, Core services continues to decline. But what was weird was this month, it wasn't shelter. So we expect shelter, the big sticky part. We're expecting that to continue to decline, to decelerate. Um, you know, I kind of thought it would bottom out in, you know, third, late third quarter, early fourth quarter, and then and then rebound. It's still higher than I expected it to be. And and no, this isn't because the BLS doesn't measure it right. We should look at Zillow rents. BLS measures it right, and Zillow rents measure something differently, and ATRR measures something different, and 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 those are different things. But for but the the BLS method of measuring uh, rents as opposed to home prices makes a lot of sense. I'm not going to go into that here. I've done podcasts on that, but but the point is that it's it it, it really hasn't gone down as much as, hasn't decelerated as much as I expected. Now, some of this, by the way, some of the reason that rents went up as much as they did is because during the eviction moratorium, they didn't go up as much as they should have, right? So eviction moratorium, you know, in COVID and into 2021 said, it doesn't matter if people don't pay rent, you can't evict them because of COVID, bad, you know, we don't want people outside or something. And, uh, and so rents didn't go up. Once, the Supreme Court said the CDC doesn't have the ability, doesn't have the authority to do that. Then rent started to accelerate because they started to catch up to where they should be. And that's one of the reasons we had the big spike in inflation was a catch up to the inflation that we'd already had. That has, we, we, that part has kind of all gone through. And so, but rents have continued to rise at a reasonably high level because the costs to a landlord have continued to rise um, and and continue to be high. But again, I sort of expected rents, and I think a lot of people expected rents to decelerate. For me, you know, I don't expect them to go into deep deflation, but I expected them to kind of bottom out in the mid twos or something like that. Well, anyway, um, you know, this month, so last month we'd we'd seen you know rents um, we'd seen primary rents rent to primary residents had been 026 percent month on month and 028 percent for owners equivalent rent and so it, it sort of looked like that was the deceleration happening this month primary rents went up 049 percent uh, so almost double what it was last month and owners equivalent rent 036 percent so uh, that was not expected. It wasn't like rents were ahead of schedule on the deceleration part um, and had to go up. So, so that's kind of odd. I mean, it doesn't fit my model. I would think rents would be going down more than that. And honestly, if you want to get really good news out of today's report, you say, well, gee, but for that, but for shelter being higher than expected, we would have had another really low core number. Um, year on year, Owner's equivalent rent is still 5.3%, but that's down from 5.45, so it's still decelerating. And primary rents um, were basically um, unchanged at uh, 5.1%-ish year-on-year. And the year-on-year number was roughly unchanged. Um, So, so, all right, 
so we've gone through all this. Oh, uh, by, by the way, another um, interesting. So in, in the core services part, shelter is, is a big part of that. When you get to super core, so you take out shelter. And so you're looking at core services, X shelter, um, you know, that part. So and that's what the Fed cares about and, and so on. Um, that number was a little bit better. Um, but that part was a little more suspicious. So uh, last month, the airfares had been down 5%, and this month they were down again, 1.6%. Um, but we also had hospital services decline more than 1% month on month. Now, hospital services have been high-ish, uh, around 7% year on year coming into this month. So, you know, it wouldn't be terribly surprising to see them regress to the mean a bit, but a 1% fall month on month is just a little odd. And so, uh, you know, Supercore improved a little bit um, because of that, but uh, but in a suspicious way. The bottom line there is if the Fed cares about Supercore, it's still too high. It, it, there's no excuse for the Fed to, to, to ease based on, on uh, Supercore. But getting back to the potential pony situation and the reverse of it, um, if the 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 fact that there are outliers every month are the reasons that we look at median. And several months ago, median calmed us down when we got a really high core number. This month, median is telling us uh, the core number at 0.15 is probably too low. Um, the median doesn't come out till the middle of the day, but we kind of know how it's calculated. So my estimate for this month is 0.268, which would be actually be the highest in four months. So the bottom line here is that um, there are various things going on. There's a, obviously there's always some give and take and things going in different directions, but the progress that we had been making on inflation or that looked like we'd been making the last two months, we'd gotten a couple of great numbers. And even on the median side, we'd gotten some really good numbers that didn't happen this month. And so you know, that doesn't mean we're reversing, but it also means that we at least have for a month have had a month of not so much progress. So market reaction is null, which <laughs> market doesn't know what to think. You know, going into this, people thought, well, we'll either get a number which tell, says the Fed, you know, shouldn't be, uh, you know, should go only 25 or maybe not go at all, or we'll get a number which says the Fed should clearly ease 50 basis points in September. We got a number which doesn't really tell us anything new um, or you, or put it a different way. You can take whatever you want out of it. Um, it it's still surprising to me to see no surprise in the market, <laughs> no real reaction in the market, but that's what we got. I do think that from the, from the standpoint of investors looking at the Fed, there is nothing here that says the Fed needs to ease 50 basis points immediately. But the Fed is no longer – the Fed will not ease because the, the, the inflation numbers are so much better. If, they, if the Fed eases – and I think they will ease. But if they ease, it's because of the, the job situation. There's, we're clearly slipping cre – there's credit defaults are going up. Jobs are getting a little bit uh, – uh, the jobs market getting a little softer. Um, I I don't think that with inflation as high as it is, the Fed ought to be preemptively easing. But I am not on the Federal Reserve Board, you know, yet. Uh, so my vote doesn't count. But that's what I think is happening. And, uh, and that's all that I have to say about this month's CPI. And so that's all for today's podcast. Please like, subscribe, refer others. Check out the blog at inflationguy.blog where this report is done in sort of a printed form with some nice charts and things like that. Um, you can uh, uh, subscribe to the quarterly inflation outlook if you want to go to the uh, to inflationguy.blog or there's a link in the show notes to how to subscribe to the quarterly. Um, visit Enduring Investments if you need help with diagnosing, with treating, and inflation problems. Of course, you can follow me on x at inflation underscore guy. And most importantly, Defend your money. And if inflation is coming for you, remember, you know a guy.